Good morning. Let's open our Bibles to Acts chapter 13. We are going to, uh, for the young adults who are in here, we're just going to continue in our series in the book of Acts. And for the rest of you, as we open up this morning, uh, we're going to start in Acts 13, uh, but I want to show you Acts chapter 1 verse 8, just by way of introduction, uh, if it's been a little while since you've read the book of Acts. So in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, the risen Lord Jesus says to his disciples, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And Acts 1.8 is somewhat of a, an outline, a geographical outline at least, for the whole book of Acts. And beginning from Jerusalem, where the apostles are commissioned and empowered on the day of Pentecost when they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, uh, it begins in Jerusalem, and there's this centrifugal movement outward from Jerusalem in the whole book of Acts. And, and the pattern is beginning in Jerusalem and going out into all Judea and Samaria and finally to the ends of the earth. And where we are at in Acts chapter 13 this morning is actually a transition into a, a new major section of the book. Because in chapter 1 and 2, the apostles were commissioned, they were sent and empowered. And then in chapters 3 through 7, they're in Jerusalem, and specifically in the temple, where there's much conflict and uh, much witnessing, preaching going on uh, by the apostles in Jerusalem. And then in chapters 8 through 12, which is where we left off last week at the end of chapter 12, in those chapters, the, the witness of the apostles goes out into all Judea and Samaria, of course, and, and beyond that, before you get to the end of chapter 12, uh, you've got the account of Peter at the house of Cornelius in Caesarea, where Cornelius, the first uh, really major Gentile figure, has received the gift of the Holy Spirit and he's baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And so now the gospel in earnest is going uh, to the Gentiles. Now, at the beginning of chapter 13, we're making a transition into the last phase of this, this mission of the apostles, where the gospel is going to the ends of the earth, where the, the inclusion of the Gentiles in the new covenant and their reception of forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit is unmitigated. Um, it's advancing. So that's where we pick up here in Acts chapter 13 this morning. And uh, in this section of the book, in chapters 13 and 14, we will watch Barnabas and Saul as they travel on what is traditionally known as the first missionary journey. And then, of course, in chapter 15 is the familiar account of the Jerusalem Council, where the, the great doctrinal and pastoral issues surrounding the law of circumcision are dealt with and hashed out. So that's this next section of the book, broadly speaking. And last week, if you were with us, in chapter 12, we saw that the Lord Jesus triumphed over Herod's hostility and hubris through the prayers of the church. And we concluded in, uh, with chapter 12, verse 24. Verse 25 is, is kind of setting up for chapter 13. But in verse 24 of chapter 12, you read, But the word of God increased and multiplied. That is, in the context of this great hostility, the word of God is increasing it's growing and multiplying. And that really sums up chapters 8 through 12 of the book. And so this morning, in the first 12 verses of chapter 13, uh, we will see that the Word of God triumphed on the island of Cyprus, especially through Paul's proclamation and defense, although Barnabas and John Mark were with him. And as we consider how this applies to us today, we, uh, we remember that Luke wrote this book to encourage Theophilus and other early Christians with him. 
And we find ourselves this morning, like that original audience, with the call on our lives to be witnesses to the risen Lord Jesus. In the context of a world that is opposed to that word, it's encouraging to be reminded that it cannot fail to accomplish God's purposes. It's an encouragement for us in this text this morning. This is a message about the triumph of the Word of God and the impotence of idols. So let's read it. Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 12. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him. I don't have a comment on this in the rest of the lesson, but you see in verse 9, Saul, who was called Paul. This is the first time he's referred to as Paul in the New Testament, and uh, it's because Saul was his Jewish name, and now going into a Gentile context, uh, he's being referred to by his uh, Roman name, Paul. He looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. So you see in the first three verses, the divine commission of Barnabas and Saul. It was to go out from Antioch to pursue the work of the ministry which had been prepared for them. And as Luke brings our attention to the church at Antioch, Antioch, he introduces us to Uh, an array of what he refers to in verse 1. Prophets and teachers. And two of the figures within this group of prophets and teachers are familiar to us at this point in the study of Acts. The first listed and the last, Barnabas and Saul. And uh, there are three more who we know very little about, relatively speaking, other than what Luke gives us in verse 1. And Luke's reason for listing these prophets and, and teachers was to pull back the veil of space and time for us, to give us a, a, a look into the inner life of the Church of Antioch as it was making a very significant advance in their mission. As they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, or in the New American Standard, as literally as they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, a word came from them, to them from the Spirit of God. And notice in verse 2, that Luke wrote, the Holy Spirit said. Luke did not view, and indeed nowhere does the Bible teach, that the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, is merely an impersonal force. He is one who speaks. As we confess of the Holy Spirit in the Nicene Creed, we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. The, the, the 
act of, of speaking attributed to the Spirit of God is a revelation of His divine personhood. And the command of the Holy Spirit for the church comes in the last portion of verse 2, you see. Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Barnabas and Saul were handpicked by God and called to work, to walk in the works which the Lord had already prepared for them. The Spirit of God called them and the church was to appoint them and to send them out. So that's what they did. After praying in verse 3, presumably for God's blessing and safety on their travels and fruitfulness in their ministry, they sent them off. The Antioch church held Barnabas and Saul with open hands, uh, trusting not in their own wisdom, but that of the Spirit to send his servants where he pleases. And it's obvious that Barnabas and Saul were of uh, two uniquely gifted brothers who had already proven to be very useful to this church, but they were released from their ministerial duties there uh, because the church trusted the Lord to provide for them. And above all, they desired to obey him. So in verses 1 through 3, we see the divine command of, uh, divine commission of Barnabas and Saul. It was to go out from Antioch. And from there, we learn that Paul, Barnabas, and John Mark proclaimed and defended the word of God on the island of Cyprus, first at Salamis. The journey from Antioch the city of Antioch, west to the port of Seleucia, was about 16 miles overland. And from there, they sailed westward about 60 to 80 miles to the island of Cyprus. And they land first at the town of Salamis. Evidently, it was a large town. There were multiple synagogues within it. And those synagogues were the arenas for their ministry of the word. We don't get any indication in this passage as to the reception of the word in the Salamis synagogues. But Luke does let us know at this point that with Barnabas and Saul, you see in, at the end of verse 5, uh, with them was John Mark. And we learned from chapter 12 that this is the son of Mary uh, who joined Barnabas and Saul from Jerusalem to Antioch, and now he's their traveling companion and assistant in ministry. And then... They went through the whole island as far as Paphos, the capital city on the west side. That governmental center of the province was to be the theater for this conflict to come. And we get our introduction to the antagonist in that conflict in the last part of verse 6. He's a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. Now, to call this man both a magician and Jewish is somewhat of a paradox because uh, the Lord abominated all forms of magic in the law, especially in Deuteronomy 18. But that's why Luke called him a false, false prophet. Ironically, his name means son of Jesus. And Paul will make use of that irony soon. This magician was with the proconsul, meaning that he had some kind of acquaintance with the civil governor of, of, the, of the entire province. He was the ruler uh, over the island of Cyprus. And it may be that he had some form of influence based on this close relationship with the proconsul. And if so, that may explain why he's so antagonistic when uh, Sergius Paulus called Barnabas and Saul to hear the word. That's what he did. Sergius Paulus is described as a man of intelligence who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. <clears throat> Evidently, a report about them, it, it must have traveled fast. And we know from this that it traveled to high places. Soon after their arrival on this island, they had an audience with the civil governor of the entire <clears throat> province. He intentionally sought them out because he heard murmurs about the word of God that they carried. He wanted to hear it. That was the source of the magician's angst, and you see that in verse 8. Elymas, which was the prophet's, uh, the false prophet's other name, 
He opposed Barnabas and Saul as they proclaimed the word of God to the proconsul. Luke notes that his intention was to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Now that the false prophet has shed his sheepskin, so to speak, Paul wields the shepherd's rod to beat back the wolf in verses 9 and 10. Saul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths or the straight ways of the Lord? I do wonder what the tone in Paul's voice was when he said those words. He was being ironic when he called Bar Jesus, son of Jesus, son of the devil. But he earned that name because he was about his father's business. Jesus brought the same reproach against the Pharisees in John 8, verse 44, when he said to them, You are of your father, the devil. And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Bar Jesus was about his father's business so that even his name was a lie. He was no son of Jesus, but a son of the devil. And the rest of Paul's rebuke emphasizes that. You enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy. Paul's rebuke reveals the true scope of, of this conflict. I have to imagine that he was reflecting on instances like this later when he wrote in Ephesians 6. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. It's Ephesians 6, 12. Or again in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Already in Acts chapter 13, he's showing that he had the same conviction. He was not dealing with some illusionist, you see, when you read about this magician, he's not some illusionist who pulls rabbits out of hats. That's a different kind of magician. Paul knew the true scope of, of this conflict as he was engaged in it. He was on the field of a cosmic, spiritual battle, dealing with Satan's puppet who was trying to murder this man's soul. A helpful illustration of this comes from the biblical use of agricultural imagery, especially in the Lord's parable of the sower. The first of the four types of soil in that parable is described in Mark chapter 4, verse 4. Some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. The Lord interpreted this for us by saying, The sower sows the word. And these are the ones along the path where the word was sown. When they hear, Satan immediately takes away the word that was sown in them. In the case of our passage, the magician was the satanic bird, if you will, who sought to devour the seed of the word of God as Paul was sowing it. That illustrates what we see in verse 8. Luke wrote that the magician was seeking to turn him away from the faith. And the faith in this context refers to the objective content of the faith, the teaching based on the Word of God. It doesn't refer to the act of believing, but to the object that is believed. And the classic passage to uh, 
illustrate this is from Jude verses 3 and 4, but especially verse 3, where uh, Jude explains his purpose for writing this short letter. He says, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Here we see that Jude wrote this letter to contend for the faith that was once for all handed down to the saints. The faith is the deposit of sound doctrine based upon the Word of God that must be passed down unadulterated from one generation to the next. That is what Paul was proclaiming to the proconsul. And we see in verse 8 that it, it was what the magician was seeking to turn him away from. Now Paul says in verse 10, Will you not stop m making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? The straight paths of the Lord. Or the straight ways of the Lord. That's a figurative way of referring to the faith as we saw it in verse 8. Or in verse 7, the Word of God. As the content of the faith, the Word of God is the straight way to God. The Word is the way. Salvation comes by faith. Faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the Word of Christ. The Word about the Lord is the way to Him. And the magician wanted to make that way crooked, to pervert and distort the word so that this man would not successfully come to the Lord on the straight path. Luke didn't elaborate on the magician's methods. Like, what was he doing to uh, make the straight paths of the Lord crooked? Did he simply try to distract his attention as Paul was speaking? Or did he tamper with the content of his message? Maybe in addition to distorting the message, he cast doubt on its veracity, of, of its truthfulness. That's the ancient method of Satan, to falsify and distort. Did God really say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? The answer should have been no. He did not say that. For it is written, you may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. The serpent's words sounded just close enough to God's word to be true. That's deception. Deception is the devil's game. And maybe that's what this son of the devil was doing. That's the work of a false prophet, someone worthy of a curse. And that's what you see in verse 11. Now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Now, Paul's calling, as he puts it later in Acts chapter 26, was to go to the Gentiles to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. And notice in verse 11 that the magician was blinded for a time. This wasn't a permanent curse, but a temporary one designed to lead this man to repentance, much like Paul's blindness did in his own conversion. In fact, it's, uh, I don't know if ironic is the right word, uh, or poetic, that this man is uh, being cursed by the hand of the one who received the very same curse in his own conviction, in his own conversion. Ultimately, he was blinded so that perhaps he might in the end truly see. Even here you see the kindness and the mercy of God. Although we don't get any word on it from Scripture, um, 
Maybe from this temporary blindness, the magician would learn to sing with the psalmist. It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. Psalm 119, 71. The magician was blinded not only for his own sake, though, also for the proconsuls, and we see that in verse 11. Sorry, verse 12. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. When he saw what had happened to the magician, he believed. But the blinding curse was not the main reason for his belief. Look at verse 12. He believed for or because he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. The blinding curse accompanied the real reason for this man's faith. It was the word of God. The reason for his faith was the word. So the central message of this scene of this passage is that I would sum it up in the short statement, the word is the way. And look with me once more at this passage, and I have this on the study guide if you have it in front of you. Look with me as we tie together several phrases from this passage. First of all, in verse 7, it was the word of God that the proconsul wanted to hear. In verse 8, it was the faith that the magician was attempting to mislead him from. In verse 10, it was the straight paths or ways of the Lord that the magician was trying to make crooked. And in verse 12, it was the teaching of the Lord that astonished the proconsul and led to his saving faith. I believe that these expressions were synonymous. They're all pointing to the same reality the word of God, the faith, the straight ways of the Lord, and the teaching of the Lord. Uh, I believe they were synonymous in Luke's mind. Different ways of, of expressing the same thought. And by bringing them together, we see his main point of emphasis from this scene on Cyprus. The truth triumphed over the deceptive power of Satan. The word is the way. In other words, the word from God is the way to God. And I mean that in its fully pregnant sense. First, the written and preached word of God is the way to God. As prophets, Paul and Barnabas proclaimed the word of God as the content of the faith and the straight way of the Lord. Luke summed it up in verse 12 as the teaching about the Lord. As Paul later wrote, so faith comes by hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. Romans 10, 17. And again, in 1 Corinthians 1, 18. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. That is, the word about the cross and all that it stands for. Christ's substitutionary and sin-atoning death and resurrection to life. Paul described the sacred writings, the scriptures, with which Timothy was acquainted from his youth as able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So the word, as the written word that is to be proclaimed, is the way to God but also the eternal Word of God is the way to life. The Lord Jesus has revealed Himself to us as the Word of God who was with God in the beginning, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Jesus is the eternal Word of God, the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. He is the image of the invisible God. And further, he taught us, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And as the psalmist prophesied of Christ's death and resurrection in Psalm 16, 
you have made known to me the paths of life. That is, you have made known to me the paths or the ways that lead to life. The Apostle Peter interpreted that as a prophecy of Christ's resurrection from the dead in Acts 2.28. The Word of God has made known to us the path of life through His resurrection from the dead and ascension into heaven. The path to true life, life in glory, the life for which we were made in the presence of our Creator. The eternal Word of God made flesh is the way to life. And because it is in the written Word that the eternal Word has revealed Himself as coming in the flesh for us and for our salvation, the written Word of God is the way to God. The Word is the way. So we've seen from Acts 13, 1 through 12, that the Word of God triumphed on Cyprus, especially through Paul's proclamation and defense, although Barnabas and John Mark were with him. And further into chapter 13, in weeks to come, uh, we will see them up north in Pisidian Antioch with Paul's important and pivotal synagogue sermon. The Word is the way, and there are at least two ways that this lesson is practically useful for us based on our text, I think. And the first is this. Take heart, because the Word of God puts idols to shame. And when I say idols, I include the dark spiritual forces that animate them. So it's not just a, a block of wood that's an idol. It's the spiritual forces of darkness that animate that idol. The Lord put the sorcerers of Egypt to shame through Moses. When the Philistines stole the ark of the Lord and put it in the temple of Dagon, this is what 1 Samuel 5.4 says, when they rose early on the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen face downward on the ground before the ark of the Lord. And the head of Dagon and both his hands were lying cut off on the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. The Lord did essentially the same thing to the prophets of Baal through Elijah at Mount Carmel. This is a pattern in Scripture because God does not change. And our text is yet another illustration of that. The Word of God puts idols to shame. And this pattern, in fact, builds and builds throughout the story of Scripture until it climaxes at Christ's cross. You turn to Colossians chapter 2. In our study of Acts, I've, I've emphasized this text several times, I think, but it's, it's so clear in relating the defeat of Satan and his forces and the sin-atoning death of Christ for us. Colossians 2, 13 through 15. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him at the cross. The spiritual war was won at Christ's cross, an empty tomb. And the victory has begun in those who have already been delivered, as Paul said in Colossians 1, have already been delivered from this domain of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of His Son by virtue of union with Jesus Christ. Yet by stressing this message of triumph, neither Luke nor Paul are being insensitive to the reality of the ongoing hostility and antagonism of Satan. Idols and dark spiritual forces persist in their deception. It's true, obviously. 
These battles rage until Christ returns. And we could pick any number of contemporary examples to illustrate this. Uh, but I was, there was a, a U.S. men's national soccer game on TV yesterday. And I looked. I haven't seen any sports-related things on, in, a, in a while. And it struck me that this uh, team representing our nation, um, I would presume in, in qualifications for uh, the World Cup or something, I'm not sure. But the team representing our nation had numbers plastered on their jerseys in rainbow colors. Uh, why? How do those two things connect? Uh, it's because of the month that we're in, of course. Um, but the idol behind Pride Month and all that it represents demands worship. That's why those numbers were in rainbow colors. It demands worship through unqualified acceptance and affirmation of its adherents. Uh, and it needs to be torn down, not coddled. This month reminds us that battles still rage. It's true. And the Apostle Paul nor Luke would, would deny that. But this message of triumph encourages us to worship the God whose word cannot fail to accomplish His purpose. And Christ's triumph has begun in principle, though we await its final consummation when he returns. That teaches us to take heart as we seek to do our duty as Christ's witnesses. Which is the second practical use of the passage. Understand that the word advances through Christ's witnesses. While Paul and Barnabas were uniquely gifted, I think, as witnesses, to the word, we have all been called to join them as Christ's witnesses. Not only through elders and teachers in local churches, that's true, but also through each and every believer in their given sphere of influence. It's our duty. It's our joy and our delight. I think especially of you who will be teaching and serving in VBS in the coming uh, weeks, and your theme for the week is rooted in Joshua chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Or if it's not just those two verses, those are the ones I'm going to read. Um, which says this. Of course, as Joshua is receiving his commission from the Lord to take the people into the land. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened, and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Vicky shared with me this on, on Wednesday night that there's a memorization challenge for the kids in this passage. Um, you guys who are teaching, and all of you, whether you're, whether you're serving in VBS or not, take this lesson to heart, even as you prepare to convey it to, to the kids. Fill your conscience and make this a conviction as you love on them. The word is the way. It puts idols to shame and advances through Christ's witnesses. It cannot fail to accomplish the purpose of God for it. It cannot fail. And I'll read, this is in Isaiah 44, verses 6 through 8, and then we will close. Uh, something about Acts 1-8 that's important to understand is uh, the commission, you will be my witnesses. And we say, we call ourselves witnesses, Christ's witnesses. We, we testify, we bear witness to the truth of God in his word. The concept of being a witness is rooted in the book of Isaiah. 
for Luke as he's, um, uh, well, and for the Lord Jesus, for that matter, when Luke is quoting him. Uh, it's all here in the book of Isaiah. And as you read, especially Isaiah 40 through 55, the idea of uh, God's people being witnesses to him in the context of hostile nations, it comes up over and over again. And it's here in Isaiah 44, 6 through 8. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and set it before me, since I appointed an ancient people. Let them declare what is to come and what will happen. And this, brothers and sisters, is the verse 8, is the exhortation I would, I would leave you with this morning. Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? And you are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? There is no rock. I know not any. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of your Son, our Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ, thanking you for your word that you have made known to us the path that leads to life through faith in the crucified and risen Son of God. Thank you, Lord. And thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit who causes us to persevere through hostility and affliction. We confess that we need you, Lord. We need you as we walk out these doors today into the work that you have before us this week. But especially, Lord, as we cross the hall and we're called to worship you. Give us the heart to do so in a way that is pleasing to you that is beneficial for your people. We thank you for the privilege of being here this morning. We do not deserve the privileges and the pleasures that we celebrate this morning, but we have them because you're gracious, because your steadfast love abounds toward us in your Son and Spirit. Thank you, Lord. In Christ's name, amen.